Yeah, I mean, socialism, it's so funny now because especially for young people, it's, it's, got, it's got such great PR, yeah. which is so, I mean, which is funny because why would it? Every example of socialism you see, let's finish my sentence, you know, is, I mean, true. So capitalism gets a bad rap because it's, why? Because it's selfish. You know, capitalism is about you, as we talked about trade. And when you trade for, and, and a capitalist makes a trade for their own benefit. So socialism is so much more, um, uh, it's seen as benevolent. Oh, you're a socialist, you care about other people. If you care about other people, you should be for capitalism. I mean, what other system are, is, is everyone more better off than under, under capitalism? But socialism, yeah, it's, it's, it's appealing, I think, especially to young people because they've been taught since day one that you have to sacrifice. You're here to sacrifice for the greater good for your, you asked before about you are your brother's keeper. I mean, that's socialism. You are your brother's keeper. So, hey, you know, some people have bad conditions, healthcare conditions, and we all are gonna need healthcare. So if we all just get together, we can make sure that everyone is, is uh, taken care of. Um, that's, yeah. You know, and, well, let's talk about and that. And what ends that, up happening, of course, is that no one's taken care of. Is that, is that what happens with, um, so specifically the healthcare example, um, you hear a lot of people praise, say, the Nordic countries and their system of universal healthcare. Why do you think that that's bad? What are they doing wrong there? Well, I, you know, I'm not an expert on that healthcare s system or you know the mm -hmm. Nordic countries specifically, but you know my understanding is that the, a lot of no Nordic countries are held out as this example of successful socialism. Yeah. Well, see, socialism works. Look at Norway. Look at Sweden. Those are really more mixed economies. There's elements of socialism and there's lots of elements of economic freedom as well. And when you even think about it, you could say the same thing here. I mean, even before Obamacare, now we're going back 10 years, government paid for half of all healthcare in this country. It's more even now with the advent of Obamacare. So, you know, we don't have a socialist healthcare country now, or we don't have a socialist healthcare system, but we have a system that specifically, do, well, no one can be refused healthcare for a pre-existing condition. So. You know, the, the basic premise, the basic principle is there. I mean, in a capitalist society, and it sounds so fantastic now, but it's how this country was, you know, really up until the advent of Medicare and Medicaid and government's real intrusion into healthcare. I mean, healthcare in this country, by and large, was better, in my belief, across the board, certainly more cost effective to everyone before government started getting involved with healthcare. And more, whether it's education, whether it's healthcare, yeah. whether it, everywhere government gets involved, beyond its proper scope, keeping us free. Yeah. You know, you're, not, you're going to see Ayn Rand, or I, I think, I won't say, you know, people shouldn't be complaining about the cost of, about the cost of, um, of the police. You know, I mean, I'm not saying that there's not wastes in police, there's not a problem with police, but police is the role of government. Keep me free, keep us free. But when it comes to healthcare, that's everyone's individual responsibility and right to choose for themselves. Yeah. Uh, can, can you jump into why you why you think that is with uh, whether it's education or health care that the intervention of government makes it worse? Because in case anyone's watching that is a proponent of free college sure. or free health care, free health care. Um, so it's a it's a it's a it's a deceptively simple question. Um, well, there's. It's wrong in every way. How about that one? I mean, it's wrong in every way. Uh, you know, you know. I, one of the things Ayn Rand always talks about is that there's no difference between what's practical and what's moral. What's right is also what works. We know that capitalism works, and we and we know that socialism is wrong. And it's especially true when it comes to something like higher education. The reason education is so expensive, the best example. Yeah, because it's getting more and more expensive. And it's the more and more government has gotten involved with it. I mean, this there's been books and books written about this, about it, how government loans subsidize inefficiency, push up the cost of education. We've seen the same thing in healthcare now as well. It's it's why that if you pay the list price for any drug, it's always enormous. Why? Because Healthcare providers know that there's a government subsidized payer there, Medicare, Medicaid, all, you know, so the markets are distorted. It happens every time government gets involved in any market. And it gets back to kind of what we talked about before, because, you know, what is a market? What is healthcare? Healthcare ultimately comes down to us as individuals and a healthcare provider, providers coming down and making a trade. Government starts to get involved in that and says, no, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, we're going to make the decisions here. Well, if it's going to be free education, we have to decide, well, what kind of education is it? Who should get it? How long is it? What type of topics should be discussed? 
uh, and it's going to make those decisions on for, for political purposes, not for any individual's purposes. H have you heard? And that's wrong. That's yeah. wrong. Oh, and I'll say one more thing if yeah. I could too. I mean, yeah. I mean, when we talk about liberty, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, liberty is liberty from others. So everyone says, oh, it'd be great if I had a free education, but it's not anyone's responsibility to provide you for an education. And you know what, if you can't afford to educate your kids, you shouldn't have them. That's, this is my mm. opinion. Um, Americanism, I think, is an understanding of self-reliance, self-responsibility. Doesn't mean you ex to accept help from others or that you don't help others, but it's an understanding that that's not government's role, is to give you anything, just to leave you free. Uh, have you heard, on the, kind of on the healthcare thing, have you heard of um, the uh, uh, LASIK eye surgery and sure. cosmetic surgery examples? Of course. Because I've heard that, and it I is. thought that was a kind of interesting it's, point, well, which is... Yeah, oh, yeah, right. I mean, like, you know, LASIK, this is exactly right. It's, it's such a great real-world example. But it's like, we don't need them. Look at North and South Korea. There's your friggin' real-world example. Mm -hmm. I mean, socialism versus capitalism, we see it time and time again. And LASIK is a great example. LASIK eye surgery, I think this is where you're going, generally not covered by any health, government health care. It's not covered by, it's not subsidized by government. Mm -hmm. Quality's gone up, price has gone down. Anyone can afford LASIK. It's almost like a cell phone now. When cell phones first came out, very expensive. Anyone can basically afford a cell phone now. They can get a disposable uh, uh, cell phone. So you see that time and time again, when government stays out of private relationships, stays out of markets, prices go down, quality goes up. In fact, there's even, you know, these guys have all been uh, 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 made to be demons over the years. And everyone from Andrew Carnegie, Bill Gates, these are the monopolists. Uh, um, uh, uh, names are escaping me now, but you know, the, the, oh, Sam Walton, of course, with Walmart, mm -hmm. monopolists. You know, monopolists are monopolists by our choice, our public choice, our individual choice. Because say, we're but, shopping there. Yeah, we're the like, ones like, giving like, them Amazon money. is best one now. Mm -hmm. Like Amazon mm -hmm. now, for some reason, is public enemy number one. Like, but when you ask anyone, they'd say, oh, I really, I do love Amazon. And everyone loves Amazon, and they should love Amazon. I mean, what an unbelievable, magnificent creation it is. Not just to what you can get, but what you can sell. I mean, Amazon lets anyone be a screenwriter, lets anyone be a book publisher, lets anyone pursue their, I mean, this is something that is so unbelievable novel. And what's Jeff Bezos' thanks? Thanks, he's getting basically threatened by the president, to be broken up and he gets ridiculed for having too much information and controlling too much of the market. I mean, these are, these are great heroes. What are, the, what are their suggestions for that? If they think it's a problem, what are they suggesting to, to fix it? Well, the, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna pursue antitrust. So antitrust sounds so benign, antitrust. Government's gonna come in and break up companies. They've done this time and time again, or threatened to break up companies. And it, it's, it sounds kind of out there, what does this have to do with me? I just, I just go back to this idea of think about the things, the products you use every day. Uh, Microsoft, Facebook, these, you know, it's only by these individuals' freedom. Mi Microsoft isn't just a entity. It's individuals who are there pursuing technology, pursuing uh, innovation to bring us something that we can enjoy and love. The more government get, gets involved with that, the more difficult it is for mm -hmm. that, them to achieve it. Do you believe in any regulation at all? Well, no. The answer is no. <laughs> I don't believe in any regulation at all. Um, if you protect individual rights, I mean, that's, that is essentially what, we, what you would think of as being regulation. So kind of a classic example is, um, I, I, I mean, I, there's, there's, well, the classic example, I, I just heard this on Fox the other day of like, well, if we didn't regulate air travel, then we just, planes would be falling out of the sky. <laughs> And this was from a conservative, supposedly conservative TV host. Uh, you know, think about what regulation has done to air travel. It's made it, you know, airlines are unreg supposedly unregulated, but every element of it's regulated from the, how many seats can be in a row to how many airports and air. So, so in a free market, it's in every individual, every individual trader's uh, self-interest to have a happy customer, if you will. So it's a no, no one's self-interest to poison their customer, to kill their customer. But regulation, I mean, a great example, not just LASIK, but a great example is, is, uh, is uh, uh, aspirin. You know, aspirin is uh, available over the counter. Mm -hmm. You know, if it, if it had been grandfathered in because it was invented so long ago, you wonder. It's so, aspirin is dirt cheap, so powerful. 
Um, I don't, how many billions of dollars would that take in FDA approval to actually make it to our, our, uh, our doors now? When you say grandfathered in. Before the FDA. Before the oh, FDA. Yeah, I mean, the, really? Yeah, I mean, I mean, before the FDA, did, did, did people thrive by killing their customers? No, by, you know, selling. And, you know, if you're, I think if you're foolish enough to take, you know, take a pill from anyone who offers it, I think you, I think you get what you deserve. Yeah. Um, but no, in a free market, you wouldn't need any regulation. And in fact, regulation does tremendous harm. You don't think about a bank now when you go to a bank because you think, oh, it's regulated. So there's no sense of, oftentimes what regulation does is it disguises the problems because in a free market, you know, you'd have someone saying, wait a minute, that bank doesn't have the money they need to cover those loans or to, to pay back their depositors. So no, regulation well, actually hurts markets. I, I know this is a really specific example, but speaking of drugs, what, what, do you remember the story of that guy? I think this was a couple of years ago. He bought a, a, a drug or like bought the whatever the company that that made the drug or something. Oh, Martin Shrelly. And, and he's I think I think I think it was maybe a, a cancer drug or something yeah. that helped cancer patients and just shot up the price an astronomical amount. Yes. What about an example like that? I don't want, I don't I can't speak to that because I know it's a, I know it's so Well, it's specific. it's a it's a pretty niche. I wish I was better well versed in that, mm -hmm. but I'll just say healthcare is just a textbook ex example of Price inflation, as specific as specifically as a result of government intervention, um, when you know there's mm. someone there to pick up the tab, you know government's going to pick up the tab. You have every incentive to keep prices as high as possible. Um, so, in and uh, so, I, I can't speak to it in specifically, but you know, it, what our frustration should be in when people point to something like high prices in drugs and say, "See, capitalism doesn't work. See, the mar markets are broken." I hear it in finance all the time. I mean, why, you know, why did the economy crash in 2008? They'd say, well, because see, capitalism doesn't work. Mm -hmm. That, but that wasn't certainly wasn't free markets in healthcare now or then or in banking or finance then. So inevitably, where you see crisis, where you see price inflation, when you see bad outcomes, are places in when government has a very heavy, very very heavy hand, just like medicine. How, how did they in, the, in that specific case in yeah. the last crash? Oh, in, in, in the financial crash? Yeah. I mean, every element of the financial, finance coming into the crash of 2008 was one of the high, most highly regulated businesses and influenced businesses. I mean, you know, go back to everything from the, uh, from the, uh, the liar loans, that, they were called liar loans, but the, uh, the, the no-doc loans that were incentivized for people to get into those first starter homes, to interest rates, of course, which are artificially uh, minimized, to the, the whole uh, government-created ended, uh, entities, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. These are government-sponsored entities that were basically allowed to borrow money with the implicit promise that government's going to pay it back, and that's exactly what they did. So, yeah, I mean, government is tremendously invested in finance, regulated in finance, and it, 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 it's what I believe led to the crash, and I think it's what has really hindered a lot of uh, potential growth in the years since. Because you don't believe in bailouts either. Oh, God, yeah. no. Of course not. Because you say that that's another form of charity, right? It's, it's, it's another, I mean, a bailout is a, is a terrible violation of your rights. I mean, think about that. Like you, you never bought, um, you paid off your mortgage. You uh, didn't buy a home you couldn't afford. You didn't invest and in, make risky investments. You didn't, uh, and then these people do, and then along go, comes government and says, oh, you know, we really got to help them out. So we're going to take what you created, what you saved. With tax money, which yeah. is essentially our money, and, and yeah, give Yeah, I mean, it it's them. what could be more completely uh, mm. offensive than that? And, um, but there's this, there's this mythology that, well, if we, if we don't have a bailout, then it's going to be some apocalyptic, the, the ATMs won't work, the, you know. Companies go bankrupt all the time. In a capitalist society, it's actually okay. What ends up happening is, is that the, the debtors, the creditor, or say the creditors lose their money. People lose money all the time. I'm in investments. You lose money all the time, but you do it voluntarily. You know, when I invest in a co company and goes bankrupt, I, I do it voluntarily. But when you are asked, not asked, but when you're forced to bail out a bankrupt company, that's the gun. That's government gun. That's what could be more uh, immoral. Yeah. Uh, th there was a, f a f phrase in the book um, called production for use and yes. not production for profit. Can you explain that? I mean, it, 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 it comes back to the um, 
accusation of socialist that essentially profit is exploitation of the workers, that any profit is money that's yeah. really owed to the workers. So, you know, any any surplus should go to the workers, should be used by the workers. So what's the really value of profit? And you hear that oftentimes these days when it comes to people who make a lot of money. So, well, wouldn't that be better if it was spent? Wouldn't that be better if it, But when people earn money, earn, you know, what happens to it? It's, that profit is invested. It doesn't, they don't bury it in the ground. When people earn money in a, in a capitalist and a free economy. That money is invested into new production. So the, there's this false dichotomy of like, well, the, if it's profit, then it's waste. Profit is the sign of production. Profit is what production really is. Without profit, there is no production. And it's it's a virtuous circle. I mean, there's this there's this limit, fixed pie mentality now. I think certainly socialist, but even the this nationalist branch in politics now that says, well, there's only a certain number of jobs, there's only a certain number of wealth. So it's going to be the these ones or that ones or immigrants. Or the, yeah, it's an unlimited. There's an unlimited amount of wealth that for all of us. So there's there's not this dichotomy of well, is the, is, should the money be for profit or should it be for the workers? It's for anyone who earns it, and. The profit is earned by the the owners of businesses, and it's invested into new production, new jobs. And it's a tremendously virtuous cycle, and that's the story of America. And communism would essentially be the opposite, is that right? Communism owns, the state owns the production. Yes. Is that right? Yes. I mean, communism, I mean, the, a lot of these words are, are kind of, terms are thrown out pretty casually now, I think. You know, communism is this, and socialism yeah. is that. I mean, the, the, the big categories you should know is that essentially it's individualism and everything else. Socialism, communism, fascism, nationalism, these are all forms of collectivism because they're all forms of sacrificing yourself to the group, being part of a group, whether it's you know the, the, the national Soviet states or the Cuban government, the Cuban people. Um, you know, America solely said that you own your own life, you have a right to your own life. So as you said, I mean, the traditional hallmark of communist societies is that the means of production, companies are owned by government and gov owned by the state. Still even to this day, a lot of, uh, now they're all almost inevitably bankrupt or on their way to being bankrupt. I happen to think that's going to be the next big story out of China, if you will. I mean, you know, chi China's, this isn't in the book, but, you know, China's <laughs> power, any chi any power China has gained on the world stage has come as they freed their economy, not as they've made it more right. you know, economically uh, 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 communist. So, but, but ultimately, whether it's, it's communism where the government owns the means of production or you know, nationalism or, or, excuse me, or fascism, which is what I actually think we're, we're in now, is that sure, property is privately owned, but government is going to tell you exactly how to use it. You know, government's going to tell you what to produce and how to produce and where to buy and, and uh, you know, where the planes can fly and where new airports can be built. I'm using just a few of our, our recent examples. Yeah. So. Well, th there's another question in there. What is the difference between communism and fascism? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, that that is probably, that that's the clearest kind of uh, answer is that communism, the means of production are owned by the government, owned by the state. Fascism, yeah, they're privately owned, but it's really controlled ultimately by the government, by regulation. And uh, that's just as dangerous. That's just as dangerous. Why, why do you think right now we're at risk of becoming fasc leaning Fascist. towards fascism? Well, it's funny. You know, communism has been so humiliated over and over and over again that you don't see any people ca really campaigning pro ca communism. Pro communism. I mean, even yeah. even Bernie Sanders, who's really kind of the I give Bernie a tremendous amount of credit for being philosophically c consistent. You know what he stands for, which I really I really respect. Uh, I don't respect his politics at all, obviously. Um, but so no, I mean, I think. Fascism is almost like a, a more, it's a more, uh, it's a more deceptive, I think, form of collectivism because it says, oh, no, no, you know, private property is privately owned. You have your own business, you have your own business, but government's going to tell you exactly, well, first of all, I mean, these days it's like which businesses should fail and which businesses should succeed. You know, under Obama, I'm an investment guy. So under Obama, it was the oil companies and the hedge funds. Those were we don't need those. We have to help the teachers. We have to help the steel workers. You know, for for Trump, it's going to be farmers or it's going to be mm. I don't know, whoever his favorite groups are. This is so contrary to Americanism. There's no, you know, Americanism says you know that no one gets favors from the government. No one gets freebies from anyone else. There's not free, of course. No one gets uh, subsidies. No one gets that. It's not government's role at all. People are left free. 
So, um, and, and out of the economy, just as there's a separation of church and state, so there has to be a separation of the economy and the state as well. In a true capitalist laissez-faire economy, which is what America really is. There's, there's another phrase in the book called the greatest, uh, what is it, the, the greatest... Uh, the greatest good for the greatest, greatest number? Greatest number, yes. Yeah, is I mean, that pretty much in the same vein? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, collectivists have all these little tricks to kind of, you know, hook you in, hook you in. They'd say, oh, well, you know, we are, you are your brother's keeper. Oh, yeah, I, I heard that in church for a long time, I guess, my brother's keeper. Or they'll say, you know, hey, we have to do the greatest good for the greatest number. I mean, it's, you know, it's the story of Socrates, right? I mean, the greatest good for the greatest number is they killed Socrates. But America isn't about majority rule. It's not about the greatest good for the greatest. It's about the greatest good for each individual. Every individual owns his own life. And, um, you know, the, 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 it's not a question of counting of noses. You know, your, your rights in America don't define on, well, is everyone in a good mood today or do they want to vote to gang up on me and you know, make me walk the plank? So all these little catchphrases, these little slogans that I think collectivists use, you mentioned one of them, I think the candidate um, on social media I saw, uh, the guy <laughs> yeah. from Florida said, you know, it's all about the collective. Hey, we're all in it together. And that was so funny because I was reading, I was reading this book as, because the, the, the midterm elections were, were yesterday. Yeah. And I was, you know, preparing for this and I was reading the book and all that. And I, I went on Twitter and I read, that was the exact line was in his concession speech. It was like, blah, blah, blah. blah. And then the line was, it, it's all about the collective. And I thought that was so, it was such an interesting, blatant yes. statement. And reading a book about individ, individualism, I think I commented. Uh, and no one, no one yeah. says anything because it's very like, oh yeah, it is all about the collective. But, but don't be mistaken, you know, when people hear, well, I'm an individualist, what do they say? Oh, well, you, what, do you, you don't work with anyone else? You don't want to be with anyone else? You just want to live on an island by yourself? And that's, it's like the, I wish I could sometimes debate, that's why I think, you know, debate real arguments as against a straw man, because of course that's a ter terrific straw man. I mean, individualists work with people all the time. That's yeah. how that's how every individual succeeds, Michelle, is by working with Trade, others. Trade. Is I'm by saying. trading with, exactly, and, and doing it for their own selfish benefit, doing it for themselves. So to be an individualist doesn't mean not to care about other people, not to work with other people, to collaborate with other people, but to do it freely and to do it based on your own voluntary choice and not because government points to you and says, hey, you, go there and do that. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for watching the episode. If you're interested in contributing to the conversation and supporting the show, there's two easy things you can do. One, click subscribe. And two, visit our Patreon page where you get exclusive access to the Exploring Minds community.